Wise men truly are they of Thessaly, and good reason had they to change their minds in time and consult for their own safety, for to pass by other matters they must have felt that they lived in a country which may easily be brought under and subdued. Nothing more is needed than to turn the river upon their lands by an embankment which should fill up the gorge and force the stream from its present channel, and lo, all Thessaly except the mountains would at once be laid under water. The king aimed in this speech at the sons of Aleus, who were Thessalians, and had been the first of all the Greeks to make submission to him. He thought that they had made their friendly offers in the name of the whole people. So Xerxes, when he had viewed the place and made the above speech, went back to Therma. The stay of Xerxes in Pieria lasted for several days, during which a third part of his army was employed in cutting down the woods on the Macedonian mountain range to give his forces free passage into Perabia. At this time the heralds who had been sent into Greece to require earth for the king returned to the camp, some of them empty-handed, others with earth and water. Among the number of those from whom earth and water were brought were the Thessalians, Dolopians, Enionians, Peribians, Locrians, Magnetians, Malians, Achaeans, and Theotis, Thebans, and Boeotians generally, except those of Plataea and Thespiae. These are the nations against whom the Greeks that had taken up arms to resist the barbarians swore the oath which ran thus, from all those of Greek blood who delivered themselves up to the Persians without necessity when their affairs were in good condition, we will take a tithe of their goods and give it to the god at Delphi. So ran the words of the Greek oath. King Xerxes had sent no heralds either to Athens or Sparta to ask earth and water for a reason which I will now relate. When Darius, some time before, sent messengers for the same purpose, they were thrown at Athens into the pit of punishment, at Sparta into a well, and bidden to take therefrom earth and water for themselves and carry it to their king. On this account Xerxes did not send to ask them. What calamity came upon the Athenians to punish them for their treatment of the heralds, I can't say, unless it were the laying waste of their city and territory, but that, I believe, was not on account of this crime. On the Lacedaemonians, however, the wrath of Talthybius, Agamemnon's herald, fell with violence. Talthybius has a temple at Sparta, and his descendants, who are called Talthibiadi, still live there and have the privilege of being the only persons who discharge the office of herald. When therefore the Spartans had done the deed of which we speak, the victims at their sacrifices failed to give good tokens, and this failure lasted for a very long time. Then the Spartans were troubled, and regarding what had befallen them as a grievous calamity, they held frequent assemblies of the people and made proclamation through the town was any Lacedaemonian willing to give his life for Sparta? Upon this, two Spartans, Sperthias, the son of Aneristus, and Bulis, the son of Nicolaus, both men of noble birth and among the wealthiest in the place, came forward and freely offered themselves as an atonement to Xerxes for the heralds of Darius slain at Sparta. So the Spartans sent them away to the Medes to undergo death. Nor is the courage which these men hereby displayed alone worthy of wonder, but so likewise are the following speeches which were made by them. On their road to Susa, they presented themselves before Hidanes. This Hidanes was a Persian by birth and had the command of all the nations that dwelt along the sea coast of Asia. He accordingly showed them hospitality and invited them to a banquet, where, as they feasted, he said to them, Men of Lacedaemon, why will ye not consent to be friends with the king? Ye have but to look at me and my fortune to see that the king knows well how to honour merit. In like manner ye yourselves, were ye to make your submission to him, would receive at his hands, seeing that he deems you men of merit, some government in Greece. 
Idanes, they answered, thou art a one-sided counsellor. Thou hast experience of half the matter, but the other half is beyond thy knowledge. A slave's life thou understandest, but never having tasted liberty thou canst not tell whether it be sweet or no. Ah, hadst thou known what freedom is, thou wouldst have bidden us fight for it, not with the spear only, but with the battle-axe. So they answered Hidanis. And afterwards, when they were come to Susa into the king's presence, and the guards ordered them to fall down and do obeisance, and went so far as to use force to compel them, they refused, and said they would never do any such thing, even were their heads thrust down to the ground, for it was not their custom to worship men, and they had not come to Persia for that purpose. So they fought off the ceremony, and having done so, addressed the king in words much like the following. O king of the Medes, the Lacedaemonians have sent us hither in the place of those heralds of thine who were slain in Sparta to make atonement to thee on their account. Then Xerxes answered with true greatness of soul that he would not act like the Lacedaemonians, who by killing the heralds had broken the laws which all men hold in common. As he had blamed such conduct in them, he would never be guilty of it himself. And besides, he didn't wish by putting the two men to death to free the Lacedaemonians from the stain of their former outrage. This conduct on the part of the Spartans caused the anger of Talthybius to cease for a while, notwithstanding that Spertheus and Bullis returned home alive. But many years afterwards it awoke once more, as the Lacedaemonians themselves declare during the war between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians. In my judgment this was a case wherein the hand of heaven was most plainly manifest. That the wrath of Talthybius should have fallen upon ambassadors and not slacked till it had full vent, so much justice required, but that it should have come upon the sons of the very men who were sent up to the Persian king on its account, upon Nicolaus the son of Bulis, and Enaristus the son of Spertheus, the same who carried off fishermen from Tyrins when cruising in a well-manned merchant ship, this does seem to me to be plainly a supernatural circumstance. Yet certain it is that these two men, having been sent to Asia as ambassadors by the Lacedaemonians, were betrayed by Sitalkes, the son of Teres, king of Thrace, and Nymphodorus, the son of Pythes, a native of Abdera, and being made prisoners at Byzanthi upon the Hellespont, were conveyed to Attica, and there put to death by the Athenians, at the same time as Aristeus, the son of Adamantus the Corinthian. All this happened, however, many years after the expedition of Xerxes. To return, however, to my main subject, the expedition of the Persian king, though it was in name directed against Athens, threatened really the whole of Greece. And of this the Greeks were aware some time before, but they didn't all view the matter in the same light. Some of them had given the Persian earth and water, and were bold on this account, deeming themselves thereby secured against suffering hurt from the barbarian army, while others who had refused compliance were thrown into extreme alarm. For whereas they considered all the ships in Greece too few to engage the enemy, it was plain that the greater number of states would take no part in the war, but warmly favoured the Medes. And here I feel constrained to deliver an opinion, which most men I know will mislike but which, as it seems to me to be true, I am determined not to withhold. Had the Athenians, from fear of the approaching danger, quitted their country, or had they, without quitting it, submitted to the power of Xerxes, there would certainly have been no attempt to resist the Persians by sea, in which case the course of events by land would have been the following. Though the Peloponnesians might have carried ever so many breastworks across the isthmus, yet their allies would have fallen off from the Lacedaemonians, not by voluntary desertion, but because town after town must have been taken by the fleet of the barbarians. 
and so the Lacedaemonians would at last have stood alone, and standing alone would have displayed prodigies of valour and died nobly. Either they would have done thus, or else before it came to that extremity, seeing one Greek state after another embrace the cause of the Medes, they would have come to terms with King Xerxes, and thus, either way, Greece would have been brought under Persia. For I can't understand of what possible use the walls across the isthmus could have been if the king had had the mastery of the sea. If then a man should now say that the Athenians were the saviors of Greece, he wouldn't exceed the truth, for they truly held the scales, and whichever side they espoused must have carried the day. They too it was who, when they had determined to maintain the freedom of Greece, roused up that portion of the Greek nation which had not gone over to the Medes, and so, next to the gods, they repulsed the invader. Even the terrible oracles which reached them from Delphi and struck fear into their hearts failed to persuade them to fly from Greece. They had the courage to remain faithful to their land and await the coming of the foe. When the Athenians, anxious to consult the oracle, sent their messengers to Delphi, hardly had the envoys completed the customary rites about the sacred precinct and taken their seats inside the sanctuary of the god, when the Pythoness, Aristonice by name, thus prophesied, Wretches, why sit ye here? Fly, fly to the ends of creation, quitting your homes and to the crags which your city crowns with her circlet, Neither the head nor the body is firm in its place, nor at bottom firm the feet, nor the hands, nor resteth the middle uninjured, all, all ruined and lost, since fire and impetuous Ares, speeding along in a Syrian chariot, hastes to destroy her, not alone shalt thou suffer, full many the towers he will level, many the shrines of the gods he will give to a fiery destruction, even now they stand with dark sweat, horribly dripping, trembling and quaking for fear, and lo, from the high roofs trickleth black blood, sign prophetic of hard distresses impending. Get ye away from the temple and brood on the ills that await ye. When the Athenian messengers heard this reply, they were filled with the deepest affliction. Whereupon Timon, the son of Androbulus, one of the men of most mark among the Delphians, seeing how utterly cast down they were at the gloomy prophecy, advised them to take an olive branch and, entering the sanctuary again, consult the oracle as suppliants. The Athenians followed this advice, and going in once more, said, O king, we pray thee reverence these bows of supplication which we bear in our hands, and deliver to us something more comforting concerning our country, else we will not leave thy sanctuary, but will stay here till we die. Upon this the priestess gave them a second answer, which was the following. Pallas has not been able to soften the lord of Olympus, though she has often prayed him and urged him with excellent counsel, yet once more I address thee in words than adamant firmer. When the foe shall have taken whatever the limit of Kekrops holds within it, and all which divine Kitharan shelters. Then far-seeing Zeus grants this to the prayers of Athena. Safe shall be the wooden wall continue for thee and thy children. Wait not the tramp of the horse, nor the footman mightily moving over the land, but turn your back to the foe and retire ye. Yet shall a day arrive when ye shall meet him in battle. Holy Salamis, thou shalt destroy the offspring of women when men scatter the seed and when they gather the harvest. This answer seemed, as indeed it was, gentler than the former one. So the envoys wrote it down and went back with it to Athens. When, however, upon their arrival they produced it before the people and inquiry began to be made into its true meaning, Many and various were the interpretations which men put on it. Two, more especially, seemed to be directly opposed to one another. Certain of the old men were of opinion that the god meant to tell them the citadel would escape. 
that this was anciently defended by a palisade, and they supposed that barrier to be the wooden wall of the oracle. Others maintained that the fleet was what the god pointed at, and their advice was that nothing should be thought of except the ships, which had best be at once got ready. Still such as said the wooden wall meant the fleet were perplexed by the last two lines of the oracle. Holy Salamis, thou shalt destroy the offspring of women, when men scatter the seed, or when they gather the harvest. These words caused great disturbance among those who took the wooden wall to be the ships, since the interpreters understood them to mean that if they made preparations for a sea fight, they would suffer defeat off Salamis. Now there was at Athens a man who had lately made his way into the first rank of citizens. His true name was Themistocles, but he was known more generally as the son of Neocles. This man came forward and said that the interpreters had not explained the oracle together aright. For if, he argued, the clause in question had really respected the Athenians, it would not have been expressed so mildly. The phrase used would have been luckless Salamis rather than holy Salamis. Had those to whom the island belonged been about to perish in its neighborhood. Rightly taken, the response of the god threatened the enemy much more than the Athenians. He therefore counseled his countrymen to make ready to fight on board their ships, since they were the wooden wall in which the god told them to trust. When Themistocles had thus cleared the matter, the Athenians embraced his view, preferring it to that of the interpreters. The advice of these last had been against engaging in a sea fight. All the Athenians could do, they said, was, without lifting a hand in their defence, to quit Attica and make a settlement in some other country. Themistocles had before this given a counsel which prevailed very seasonably. The Athenians, having a large sum of money in their treasury, the produce of the mines at Lorium, were about to share it among the full-grown citizens who would have received ten drachmas apiece, when Themistocles persuaded them to forbear the distribution and build with the money two hundred ships to help them in their war against the Aegeanetans. It was the breaking out of the Aegeanetan war which was at this time the saving of Greece, for hereby were the Athenians forced to become a maritime power. The new ships weren't used for the purpose for which they had been built, but became a help to Greece in her hour of need. And the Athenians had not only these vessels ready before the war, but they likewise set to work to build more. While they determined in a council which was held after the debate upon the oracle, that according to the advice of the god they would embark their whole force aboard their ships, and with such Greeks as chose to join them, give battle to the barbarian invader. Such then were the oracles which had been received by the Athenians. The Greeks who were well affected to the Grecian cause, having assembled in one place, and there consulted together, and interchanged pledges with each other, agreed that before any other step was taken, the feuds and enmities which existed between the different nations should first of all be appeased. Many such there were, but one was of more importance than the rest, namely the war which was still going on between the Athenians and the Aegeanetans. When this business was concluded, understanding that Xerxes had reached Sardis with his army, they resolved to dispatch spies into Asia to take note of the king's affairs. At the same time, they determined to send ambassadors to the Argives and conclude a league with them against the Persians, while they likewise dispatched messengers to Galo, the son of Dinomenes in Sicily, to the people of Corsaira, and to those of Crete, exhorting them to send help to Greece. Their wish was to unite, if possible, the entire Greek name in one, and so to bring all to join in the same plan of defence, inasmuch as the approaching dangers threatened all alike. Now the power of Galo was said to be very great, far greater than that of any single Grecian people. So when these resolutions had been agreed upon, and the quarrels between the states made up, First of all, they sent into Asia three men as spies. 
These men reached Sardis and took note of the king's forces, that being discovered were examined by order of the generals who commanded the land army, and having been condemned to suffer death were led out to execution. Xerxes, however, when the news reached him, disapproving the sentence of the generals, sent some of his bodyguard with instructions, if they found the spies still alive, to bring them into his presence. The messengers found the spies alive, and brought them before the king, who, when he heard the purpose for which they had come, gave orders to his guards to take them round the camp, and show them all the footmen and all the horse letting them gaze at everything to their heart's content. Then, when they were satisfied, to send them away unharmed to whatever country they desired. For these orders, Xerxes gave afterwards the following reasons. Had the spies been put to death, he said, the Greeks would have continued ignorant of the vastness of his army, which surpassed the common report of it, while he would have done them a very small injury by killing three of their men. On the other hand, by the return of the spies to Greece, his power would become known, and the Greeks, he expected, would make surrender of their freedom before he began his march, by which means his troops would be saved all the trouble of an expedition. This reasoning was like to that which he used upon another occasion. While he was staying at Abydos, he saw some corn ships which were passing through the Hellespont from the Euxine on their way to Aegina and the Peloponnese. His attendants, hearing that they were the enemies, were ready to capture them, and looked to see when Xerxes would give the signal. He, however, merely asked whither the ships were bound, and when they answered, For thy foes, master, with corn on board. We too are bound thither, he rejoined, laden, among other things, with corn. What harm is it if they carry our provisions for us? So the spies, when they had seen everything, were dismissed and came back to Europe. The Greeks, who had banded themselves together against the Persian king, after dispatching the spies into Asia, sent next ambassadors to Argos. The account which the Argives give of their own proceedings is the following. They say that they had information from the very first of the preparations which the barbarians were making against Greece, so, as they expected that the Greeks would come upon them for aid against the assailant, they sent envoys to Delphi to inquire of the god what it would be best for them to do in the matter. They had lost, not long before, six thousand citizens who had been slain by the Lacedaemonians under Cleomenes, the son of Anaxandridas, which was the reason why they now sent to Delphi. When the Pythoness heard their question, she replied, Hated of all thy neighbours, beloved of the blessed immortals, sit thou still, with thy lance drawn inward, patiently watching. Warily guard thine head, and the head will take care of the body. This prophecy had been given them some time before the envoys came, but still when they afterwards arrived it was permitted them to enter the council house and there deliver their message. And this answer was returned to their demands. Argos is ready to do as ye require, if the Lacedaemonians will first make a truce for thirty years, and will further divide with Argos the leadership of the allied army. Although in strict right the whole command should be hers, she will be content to have the leadership divided equally. Such, they say, was the reply made by the council, in spite of the oracle which forbade them to enter into a league with the Greeks. For while, not without fear of disobeying the oracle, they were greatly desirous of obtaining a thirty years' truce to give time for their sons to grow to man's estate, they reflected that if no such truce were concluded, and it should be their lot to suffer a second calamity at the hands of the Persians, it was likely they would fall hopelessly under the power of Sparta. But to the demands of the Argive council, the Lacedaemonian envoys made answer, they would bring before the people the question of concluding a truce. With regard to the leadership, they had received orders what to say, and the reply was that Sparta had two kings, Argos but one. It was not possible that either of the two Spartans should be stripped of his dignity, but they didn't oppose the Argive king having one vote, 
like each of them. The Argives say that they couldn't brook this arrogance on the part of Sparta, and rather than yield one jot to it, they preferred to be under the rule of the barbarians. So they told the envoys to be gone before sunset from their territory, or they should be treated as enemies. Such is the account which is given of these matters by the Argives themselves. There is another story, which is told generally through Greece, of a different tenor. Xerxes, it said, before he set forth on his expedition against Greece, sent a herald to Argos, who on his arrival spoke as follows. Men of Argos, King Xerxes speaks thus to you. We Persians deem that the Perses, from whom we descend, was the child of Perseus, the son of Danae, and of Andromeda, the daughter of Cepheus. Hereby it would seem that we come of your stock and lineage. So then it neither befits us to make war upon those from whom we spring, nor can it be right for you to fight on behalf of others against us. Your place is to keep quiet and hold yourselves aloof. Only let matters proceed as I wish, and there is no people whom I shall have in higher esteem than you. This address, says the story, was highly valued by the Argives, who therefore at the first neither gave a promise to the Greeks nor yet put forward a demand. Afterwards, however, when the Greeks called upon them to give their aid, they made the claim which has been mentioned because they knew well that the Lacedaemonians would never yield it, and so they would have a pretext for taking no part in the war. Some of the Greeks say that this account agrees remarkably with what happened many years afterwards. Callias, the son of Hipponicus, and certain others with him had gone up to Susa, the city of Memnon, as ambassadors of the Athenians upon a business quite distinct from this. While they were there, it happened that the Argives likewise sent ambassadors to Susa to ask Artaxerxes, the son of Xerxes, if the friendship which they had formed with his father still continued, or if he looked upon them as his enemies. To which King Artaxerxes replied, Most certainly it continues, and there's no city which I reckon more my friend than Argos. For my own part, I can't positively say whether Xerxes did send the herald to Argos or not, nor whether Argive ambassadors at Susa did really put this question to Artaxerxes about the friendship between them and him. Neither do I deliver any opinion hereupon other than that of the Argives themselves. This, however, I know, that if any nation were to bring all its evil deeds to a given place in order to make an exchange with some other nation, when they had all looked carefully at their neighbours' faults, they would be truly glad to carry their own back again. So, after all, the conduct of the Argives was not perhaps more disgraceful than that of others. For myself, my duty is to report all that's said, but I'm not obliged to believe it all alike a remark which may be understood to apply to my whole history. Some even go so far as to say that the Argives first invited the Persians to invade Greece because of their ill success in the war with Lacedaemon, since they preferred anything to the smart of their actual sufferings. Thus much concerning the Argives. Other ambassadors, among whom was Syagoras from Lacedaemon, were sent by the Allies into Sicily, with instructions to confer with Galo. The ancestor of this Galo, who first settled at Gela, was a native of the Isle of Telos, which lies off Triopium. When Galo was colonized by Antiphemus and the Lindians of Rhodes, he likewise took part in the expedition. In course of time, his descendants became the high priests of the gods who dwell below, an office which they held continually from the time that Tellenes, one of Galo's ancestors, obtained it in the way which I will now mention. Certain citizens of Gala, worsted in a sedition, had found a refuge at Mactorium, a town situated on the heights above Gala. Tellenes reinstated these men without any human help, solely by means of the sacred rites of these deities. From whom he received them, or how he himself acquired them, I can't say, but certain it is that relying on their power, he brought the exiles back. 
For this his reward was to be the office of high priest of those gods for himself and his seed forever. It surprises me especially that such a feat should have been performed by Tellini's, for I've always looked upon acts of this nature as beyond the abilities of common men, and only to be achieved by such as are of a bold and manly spirit, whereas Tellini's is said by those who dwell about Sicily to have been a soft-hearted and womanish person. He, however, obtained this office in the manner above described. Afterwards, on the death of Cleander, the son of Pantares, who was slain by Sabillus, a citizen of Gala, after he had held the tyranny for seven years, Hippocrates, Cleander's brother, mounted the throne. During his reign, Galo, a descendant of the high priest Tellenes, served with many others, of whom Anesidemus, the son of Pataiochus, was one, in the king's bodyguard. Within a little time, his merit caused him to be raised to the command of all the horse. For when Hippocrates laid siege to Callipolis, and afterwards to Naxos, to Zancli, to Leontini, and moreover to Syracuse, and to many cities of the barbarians, Galo, in every war, distinguished himself above all the combatants. Of the various cities above named, there was none but Syracuse, which was not reduced to slavery. The Syracusans were saved from this fate after they had suffered defeat on the river Elorus by the Corinthians and Corsairians, who made peace between them and Hippocrates on condition of their ceding Camarina to him, for that city anciently belonged to Syracuse. When, however, Hippocrates, after a reign of the same length as that of Cleander, his brother, perished near the city of Hybla, as he was warring with the native Sicilians, then Galo, pretending to espouse the cause of the two sons of Hippocrates, Euclides and Cleander, defeated the citizens who were seeking to recover their freedom, and having done so, set aside the children, and himself took the kingly power. After this piece of good fortune, Galo likewise became master of Syracuse, and in the following manner. The Syracusan landholders, as they were called, had been driven from their city by the common people, assisted by their own slaves, the Calyrians, and had fled to Casmini. Galo brought them back to Syracuse, and so got possession of the town, for the people surrendered themselves and gave up their city on his approach. Being now master of Syracuse, Galo cared less to govern Galo, which he therefore entrusted to his brother Hiero, while he strengthened the defences of his new city, which indeed was now all in all to him. And Syracuse sprang up rapidly to power, and became a flourishing place. For Galo raised Camarina to the ground, and brought all the inhabitants to Syracuse, and made them citizens. He also brought thither more than half the citizens of Gala, and gave them the same rights as the Camarinians. So likewise with the Megarians of Sicily. After besieging their town and forcing them to surrender, he took the rich men, who having made the war, looked now for nothing less than death at his hands, and carrying them to Syracuse, established them there as citizens, while the common people, who as they had not taken any share in the struggle, felt secure that no harm would be done to them. He carried likewise to Syracuse, where he sold them all as slaves to be conveyed abroad. He did the like also by the Eubians of Sicily, making the same difference. His conduct towards both nations arose from his belief that a people was a most unpleasant companion. In this way, Galo became a great king. When the Greek envoys reached Syracuse and were admitted to an audience, they spoke as follows. We've been sent hither by the Lacedaemonians and Athenians, with their respective allies, to ask thee to join us against the barbarian. Doubtless thou hast heard of his invasion, and art aware that a Persian is about to throw a bridge over the Hellespont, and bringing with him out of Asia all the forces of the east to carry war into Greece professing indeed that he only seeks to attack Athens, but really bent on bringing all the Greeks into subjection. Do thou therefore, we beseech thee, aid those who would maintain the freedom of Greece, 
and thyself assist to free her, since the power which thou wieldest is great, and thy portion in Greece as Lord of Sicily is no small one. For if all Greece join together in one, there will be a mighty host collected, and we shall be a match for our assailants. But if some turn traitors, and others refuse their aid, and only a small part of the whole body remains sound, then there is reason to fear that all Greece may perish. For do not thou cherish a hope that the Persian, when he has conquered our country, will be content and not advance against thee. Rather take thy measures beforehand and consider that thou defendest thyself when thou givest aid to us. Wise counsels, be sure, for the most part, have prosperous issues. Thus spake the envoys, and Galo replied with vehemence, Greeks, Ye have had the face to come here with selfish words and exhort me to join in league with you against the barbarian. Yet when I here while asked you to join with me in fighting barbarians, what time the quarrel broke out between me and Carthage, and when I earnestly besought you to revenge on the men of Egesta their murder of Dorius, the son of Anaxandridas, promising to assist you in setting free the trading places from which you receive great profits and advantages, you neither came hither to give me succour, nor yet to revenge Darius. But for any efforts on your part to hinder it, these countries might at this time have been entirely under the barbarians. Now, however, that matters have prospered and gone well with me, while the danger has shifted its ground and at present threatens yourselves, Lo, you call Galo to mind, but though ye slighted me then, I will not imitate you now. I am ready to give you aid, and to furnish as my contribution two hundred triremes, twenty thousand men-at-arms, two thousand cavalry, and an equal number of archers, slingers, and light horsemen, together with corn for the whole Grecian army, so long as the war shall last. These services, however, I promise on one condition, that ye appoint me chief captain and commander of the Grecian forces during the war with the barbarian. Unless ye agree to this, I will neither send succors nor come myself. Syagrus, when he heard these words, was unable to contain himself and exclaimed, Surely a groan would burst from Pelops' son Agamemnon did he hear that her leadership was snatched from Sparta by Galo and the men of Syracuse. Speak then no more of any such condition as that we should yield thee the chief command, but if thou art minded to come to the aid of Greece, prepare to serve under Lacedaemonian generals. Wilt thou not serve under a leader? Then prithee, withhold thy suckers. Hereupon Galo, seeing the indignation which showed itself in the words of Syagrus, delivered the envoys his final offer. Spartan stranger, he said, reproaches cast forth against a man are wont to provoke him to anger, but the insults which thou hast uttered in thy speech shall not persuade me to outstep good breeding in my answer. Surely if you maintain so stoutly your right to the command, it's reasonable that I should be still more stiff in maintaining mine, forasmuch as I am at the head of a far larger fleet and army. Since, however, the claim which I have put forward is so displeasing to you, I will yield, and be content with less. Take, if it please you, the command of the land force, and I will be admiral of the fleet. Or assume, if you prefer it, the command by sea, and I will be leader upon the land. Unless you are satisfied with these terms, you must return home by yourselves and lose this great alliance. Such was the offer which Galo made. Hereat broke in the Athenian envoy before the Spartan could answer, and thus addressed Galo, King of the Syracusans, Greece sent us here to thee to ask for an army and not to ask for a general. Thou, however, dost not promise to send us any army at all, if thou art not made leader of the Greeks. And this command is what alone thou sticklest for. Now when thy request was to have the whole command, we were content to keep silence, for well we knew that we might trust the Spartan envoy to make answer for us both. But since after failing in thy claim to lead the whole armament, 
thou hast now put forward a request to have the command of the fleet. Know that even should the Spartan envoy consent to this, we will not consent. The command by sea, if the Lacedaemonians do not wish for it, belongs to us. While they like to keep this command, we shall raise no dispute, but we will not yield our right to it in favour of anyone else. Where would be the advantage of our having raised up a naval force greater than that of any other Greek people, if nevertheless we should suffer Syracusans to take the command away from us? From us, I say, who are Athenians, the most ancient nation in Greece, the only Greeks who have never changed their abode, the people who are said by the poet Homer to have sent to Troy the man best able of all the Greeks to array and marshal an army, so that we may be allowed to boast somewhat. Galo replied, Athenian stranger, Ye have, it seems, no lack of commanders, but ye are likely to lack men to receive their orders. As ye are resolved to yield nothing and claim everything, ye had best make haste back to Greece and say that the spring of her year is lost to her. The meaning of this expression was the following. As the spring is manifestly the finest season of the year, so, he meant to say, were his troops the finest of the Greek army. Greece, therefore, deprived of his alliance, would be like a year with the spring taken from it. Then the Greek envoys, without having any further dealings with Galo, sailed away home. And Galo, who feared that the Greeks would be too weak to withstand the barbarians, and yet couldn't anyhow bring himself to go to the Peloponnese, and there, though king of Sicily, serve under the Lacedaemonians, left off altogether to contemplate that course of action, and betook himself to quite a different plan. As soon as ever tidings reached him of the passage of the Hellespont by the Persians, he sent off three Pentaconters under the command of Cadmus, the son of Scythus, a native of Cos, who was to go to Delphi, taking with him a large sum of money and a stock of friendly words. There he was to watch the war and see what turn it would take. If the barbarians prevailed, he was to give Xerxes the treasure, and with it earth and water for the lands which Galo ruled. If the Greeks won the day, he was to convey the treasure back. This Cadmus had at an earlier time received from his father the kingly power at Kos in a right good condition, and had of his own free will and without the approach of any danger from pure love of justice given up his power into the hands of the people at large and departed to Sicily, where he assisted in the Samian seizure and settlement of Zankli, or Messana as it was afterwards called. Upon this occasion Galo chose him to send into Greece because he was acquainted with the proofs of honesty which he had given, and now he added to his former honourable deeds an action which isn't the least of his merits. With a vast sum entrusted to him and completely in his power, so that he might have kept it for his own use if he had liked, he didn't touch it. But when the Greeks gained the sea fight and Xerxes fled away with his army, he brought the whole treasure back with him to Sicily. They, however, who dwell in Sicily say that Galo, though he knew that he must serve under the Lacedaemonians, would nevertheless have come to the aid of the Greeks had it not been for Terillus, the son of Crinippus, king of Himera, who, driven from his city by Thero, the son of Anesidemus, king of Agigentum, brought into Sicily at this very time an army of three hundred thousand men, Phoenicians, Libyans, Iberians, Ligurians, Helicicinians, Sardinians, and Corsicans, under the command of Hamilcar, the son of Hanno, king of the Carthaginians. Terillus prevailed upon Hamilcar, partly as his sworn friend, but more through the zealous aid of Anaxileus, the son of Cretines, king of Regium, who by giving his own sons to Hamilcar as hostages induced him to make the expedition. Anaxileus herein served his own father-in-law, for he was married to a daughter of Terillus by name Sidippi. So as Galo couldn't give the Greeks any aid, he sent, they say, the sum of money to Delphi. They say, too, that the victory of Galo and Thero in Sicily over Hamilcar the Carthaginian fell out upon the very day that the Greeks defeated the Persians at Salamis, 
Hamilcar, who was a Carthaginian on his father's side only, but on his mother's, a Syracusan, and who had been raised by his merit to the throne of Carthage after the battle and the defeat, as I am informed, disappeared from sight. Gado made the strictest search for him, but he couldn't be found anywhere, either dead or alive. The Carthaginians, who take probability for their guide, give the following account of this matter. Hamilcar, they say, during all the time that the battle raged between the Greeks and the barbarians, which was from early dawn till evening, remained in the camp, sacrificing and seeking favourable omens, while he burned on a huge pyre the entire bodies of the victims which he offered. Here, as he poured libations upon the sacrifices, he saw the rout of his army, whereupon he cast himself headlong into the flames, and so was consumed and disappeared. But whether Hamilcar's disappearance happened, as the Phoenicians tell us, in this way, or as the Syracusans maintain in some other, certain it is that the Carthaginians offer him sacrifice, and in all their colonies have monuments erected to his honour, as well as one which is the grandest of all at Carthage. Thus much concerning the affairs of Sicily. As for the Corsairians, whom the envoys that visited Sicily took in their way, and to whom they delivered the same message as to Galo, their answers and actions were the following. With great readiness they promised to come and give their help to the Greeks, declaring that the ruin of Greece was a thing which they couldn't tamely stand by to see, for should she fall they must the very next day submit to slavery so that they were bound to assist her to the very uttermost of their power. But notwithstanding that they answered so smoothly, yet when the time came for the suckers to be sent, they were of quite a different kind, and though they manned sixty ships, it was long ere they put to sea with them, and when they had so done, they went no further than the Peloponnese, where they lay too with their fleet off the Lacedaemonian coast, about Pylos and Tynarum like a Galo, watching to see what turn the war would take, for they despaired altogether of the Greeks gaining the day, and expected that the Persians would win a great battle, and then be masters of the whole of Greece. They therefore acted, as I've said, in order that they might be able to address Xerxes in words like these, O king, though the Greeks sought to obtain our aid in their war with thee, and though we had a force of no small size, and could have furnished a greater number of ships than any Greek state except Athens, yet we refused, since we couldn't fight against thee, nor do aught to cause thee annoyance. The Corsairians hoped that a speech like this would gain them better treatment from the Persians than the rest of the Greeks, and it would have done so, in my judgment. At the same time, they had an excuse ready to give their countrymen, which they used when the time came, Reproached by them for sending no suckers, they replied that they had fitted out a fleet of sixty triremes, but that the Etesian winds didn't allow them to double Cape Malia, and this hindered them from reaching Salamis. It wasn't from any bad motive that they had missed the sea fight. In this way the Corsarians eluded the reproaches of the Greeks. The Cretans, when the envoys sent to ask aid from them, came and made their request, acted as follows. They dispatched messengers, in the name of their state, of Delphi, and asked the god whether it would make for their welfare if they should lend succour to Greece. Fools, replied the Pythoness, do ye not still complain of the woes which the assisting of Menelaus cost you at the hands of angry Minos? How wroth was he when, in spite of their having lent you no aid towards avenging his death at Camacus, you helped them to avenge the carrying off by a barbarian of a woman from Sparta. When this answer was brought from Delphi to the Cretans, they thought no more of assisting the Greeks. Minos, according to tradition, went to Sicania or Sicily, as it's now called, in search of Daedalus, and there perished by a violent death. After a while, the Cretans, warned by some god or other, made a great expedition into Sicania, all except the Polycnates and the Prysians, and besieged Camicus, which in my time belonged to Agrigentum, by the space of five years. At last, however, failing in their efforts to take the place, and unable to carry on the siege any longer from the pressure of hunger, they departed and went their way. 
Voyaging homewards, they had reached Iapigia when a furious storm arose and threw them upon the coast. All their vessels were broken in pieces, and so, as they saw no means of returning to Crete, they founded the town of Hyria, where they took up their abode, changing their name from Cretans to Messapian Iapigians, and at the same time becoming inhabitants of the mainland instead of islanders. From Hyria they afterwards founded those other towns which the Tarentines, at a much later period, endeavoured to take, but couldn't, being defeated signally. Indeed, so dreadful a slaughter of Greeks never happened at any other time, so far as my knowledge extends, nor was it only the Tarentines who suffered, but the men of Regium too, who had been forced to go to the aid of the Tarentines by Micathus, the son of Coirus, lost here three thousand of their citizens, while the number of the Tarentines who fell was beyond all count. This Micathus had been a household slave of Anaxileus and was by him left in charge of Regium. He's the same man who was afterwards forced to leave Regium when he settled at Tegea in Arcadia, from which place he made his many offerings of statues to the shrine at Olympia. This account of the Regians and the Tarentines is a digression from the story which I was relating. To return, the Pisians say that men of various nations now flocked to Crete, which was stripped of its inhabitants, but none came in such numbers as the Grecians. Three generations after the death of Minos, the Trojan War took place, and the Cretans weren't the least distinguished among the helpers of Menelaus, but on this account, when they came back from Troy, famine and pestilence fell upon them and destroyed both the men and the cattle. Crete was a second time stripped of its inhabitants, a remnant only being left, who formed, together with fresh settlers, the third Cretan people by whom the island has been inhabited. These were the events of which the Pythoness now reminded the men of Crete, and thereby she prevented them from giving the Greeks aid, though they wished to have gone to their assistance. The Thessalians didn't embrace the cause of the Medes until they were forced to do so, for they gave plain proof that the intrigues of the Aluadi weren't at all to their liking. No sooner did they hear that the Persian was about to cross over into Europe than they dispatched envoys to the Greeks, who were met to consult together at the Isthmus, whither all the states, which were well inclined to the Grecian cause, had sent their delegates. These envoys, on their arrival, thus addressed their countrymen. Men of Greece, it behoves you to guard the pass of Olympus, for thus will Thessaly be placed in safety, as well as the rest of Greece. We, for our parts, are quite ready to take our share in this work, but you must likewise send us a strong force, otherwise we give you fair warning that we shall make terms with the Persians, for we ought not to be left, exposed as we are in front of all the rest of Greece, to die in your defence, alone and unassisted. If, however, you don't choose to send us aid, you can't force us to resist the enemy, for there's no force so strong as inability. We shall therefore do our best to secure our own safety. Such was the declaration of the Thessalians. Hereupon the Greeks determined to send a body of foot to Thessaly by sea, which should defend the pass of Olympus. Accordingly, a force was collected, which passed up the Euripus, and disembarking at Alus on the coast of Achaea, left the ships there and marched by land into Thessaly. Here they occupied the defile of Tempe, which leads from Lower Macedonia into Thessaly along the course of the Peneus, having the range of Olympus on the one hand and Ossa upon the other. In this place the Greek force that had been collected amounted to about 10,000 heavy-armed men, pitched their camp, and here they were joined by the Thessalian cavalry. The commanders were, on the part of the Lacedaemonians, Evanitas, the son of Carinus, who had been chosen out of the Polemarchs, but didn't belong to the blood royal, and on the part of the Athenians, Themistocles, the son of Neocles. They didn't, however, maintain their station for more than a few days, since envoys came from Alexander, the son of Amyntas, the Macedonian, and counselled them to decamp from Tempe, telling them that if they remained in the pass, they would be trodden underfoot by the invading army, whose numbers they recounted, and likewise the multitude of their ships. So when the envoys thus counselled them, and the counsel seemed to be good, and the Macedonian who sent it friendly, they did even as he advised. 
In my opinion, what chiefly wrought on them was the fear that the Persians might enter by another pass, whereof they now heard, which led from Upper Macedonia into Thessaly through the territory of the Perebi, and by the town of Gonus, the pass by which soon afterwards the army of Xerxes actually made its entrance. The Greeks, therefore, went back to their ships and sailed away to the Isthmus. Such were the circumstances of the expedition into Thessaly. They took place when the king was at Abydos, preparing to pass from Asia into Europe. The Thessalians, when their allies forsook them, no longer wavered, but warmly espoused the side of the Medes, and afterwards, in the course of the war, they were of the very greatest service to Xerxes. The Greeks, on their return to the Isthmus, took counsel together concerning the words of Alexander, and considered where they should fix the war, and what places they should occupy. The opinion which prevailed was that they should guard the pass of Thermopylae, since it was narrower than the Thessalian defile, and at the same time nearer to them. Of the pathway by which the Greeks who fell at Thermopylae were intercepted, they had no knowledge, until, on their arrival at Thermopylae, it was discovered to them by the Trachinians. This pass, then, it was determined that they should guard in order to prevent the barbarians from penetrating into Greece through it, and at the same time it was resolved that the fleet should proceed to Artemisium in the region of Histiotis, for as those places are near to one another it would be easy for the fleet and army to hold communication. The two places may be thus described. Artemisium is where the Sea of Thrace contracts into a narrow channel running between the Isle of Scyrthus and the mainland of Magnesia. When this narrow strait is passed, you come to the line of coast called Artemisium, which is a portion of Euboea and contains a temple of Artemis. As for the entrance into Greece by Trachis, it is at its narrowest point about 50 feet wide. This, however, isn't the place where the passage is most contracted, for it's still narrower a little above and a little below Thermopylae. At Alpini, which is lower down than that place, it's only wide enough for a single carriage, and up above at the river Phoenix, near the town called Anthela, it's the same. West of Thermopylae rises a lofty and precipitous hill, impossible to climb, which runs up into the chain of Oita, while to the east the road is shut in by the sea and by marshes. In this place are the warm springs which the natives call the cauldrons, and above them stands an altar sacred to Heracles. A wall had once been carried across the opening, and in this there had of old times been a gateway. These works were made by the Phocians through fear of the Thessalians at the time when the latter came from Thesprotia to establish themselves in the land of Iolis, which they still occupy. As the Thessalians strove to reduce focus, the Phocians raised the wall to protect themselves, and likewise turned the hot springs upon the pass, so that the ground might be broken up by watercourses, using thus all possible means to hinder the Thessalians from invading their country. The old wall had been built in very remote times, and the greater part of it had gone to decay through age. Now, however, the Greeks resolved to repair its breaches, and here make their stand against the barbarian. At this point there's a village, very nigh the road, Alpini by name, from which the Greeks reckoned on getting corn for their troops. These places, therefore, seemed to the Greeks fit for their purpose. Weighing well all that was likely to happen, and considering that in this region the barbarians could make no use of their vast numbers nor of their cavalry, they resolved to await here the invader of Greece. And when news reached them of the Persians being in Pieria, straightway they broke up from the Isthmus and proceeded, some on foot to Thermopylae, others by sea to Artemisium. The Greeks now made all speed to reach the two stations, and about the same time the Delphians, alarmed both for themselves and for their country, consulted the god and received for answer a command to pray to the winds, for the winds would do Greece good service. So when this answer was given them, forthwith the Delphians sent word of the prophecy to those Greeks who were zealous for freedom, and cheering them thereby, amid the fears which they entertained with respect to the barbarian, earned their everlasting gratitude. This done, they raised an altar to the winds at Thaia, 
where Thaia, the daughter of Cephisus, from whom the region takes its name, has a precinct, and worshipped them with sacrifices. And even to the present day, the Delphians sacrifice to the winds because of this oracle. The fleet of Xerxes now departed from Therma, and ten of the swiftest sailing ships ventured to stretch across direct for Skyathus, at which place there were upon the lookout three vessels belonging to the Greeks, one a ship of Troidson, another of Aegina, and the third from Athens. These vessels no sooner saw from a distance the barbarians approaching than they all hurriedly took to flight. The barbarians at once pursued, and the Troidzenian ship, which was commanded by Prexenus, fell into their hands. Hereupon the Persians took the handsomest of the men-at-arms and drew them to the prow of the vessel where they sacrificed him, for they thought the man a good omen to their cause, seeing that he was at once so beautiful, and likewise the first captive they had made. The man who was slain in this way was called Leo, and it may be that the name he bore helped him to his fate in some measure. The Aeginetan trireme under its captain, Asonides, gave the Persians no little trouble. One of the men-at-arms, Pythes, the son of Iskenos, distinguishing himself beyond all the others who fought on that day. After the ship was taken, this man continued to resist and didn't cease fighting till he fell, quite covered with wounds. The Persians, who served as men-at-arms in the squadron, finding that he wasn't dead but still breathed, and being very anxious to save his life since he had behaved so valiantly, dressed his wounds with myrrh and bound them up with bandages of cotton. Then, when they were returned to their own station, they displayed their prisoner admiringly to the whole host and behaved towards him with much kindness. But all the rest of the ship's crew they treated merely as slaves. Thus did the Persians succeed in taking two of the vessels. The third, a trireme commanded by Formus of Athens, took to flight and ran aground at the mouth of the river Peneus. The barbarians got possession of the bark, but not of the men, for the Athenians had no sooner run their vessel aground than they leapt out and made their way through Thessaly back to Athens. When the Greeks stationed at Artemisium learned what had happened by fire signals from Sciathus, so terrified were they that quitting their anchorage ground at Artemisium and leaving scouts to watch the foe on the highlands of Euboea, they removed to Chalcis, intending to guard the Euripus. Meantime, three of the ten vessels sent forward by the barbarians advanced as far as the sunken rock between Scythus and Magnesia, which is called the Ant, and there set up a stone pillar which they had brought with them for that purpose. After this, their course being now clear, the barbarians set sail with all their ships from Therma eleven days from the time that the king quitted the town. The rock which lay directly in their course had been made known to them by Pamon of Skyrus. A day's voyage without a stop brought them to Sepias in Magnesia and to the strip of coast which lies between the town of Castanaia and the promontory of Sepias. As far as this point then, and on land as far as Thermopylae, the armament of Xerxes had been free from mischance, and the numbers were still, according to my reckoning, of the following amount. First there was the ancient complement of the twelve hundred and seven vessels which came with the king from Asia, the contingents of the nations severally, amounting, if we allow to each ship, a crew of two hundred men to two hundred and forty-one thousand four hundred. Each of these vessels had on board, besides native soldiers, thirty fighting men who were either Persians, Medes, or Sakans, which gives an account of 36,210. To these two numbers I shall further add the crews of the Pentecontas, which may be reckoned one with another at four score men each. Of such vessels there were, as I said before, 3,000, and the men on board them accordingly would be 240,000. This was the sea force brought by the king from Asia, and it amounted in all to 517,610 men. The number of the foot soldiers was 1,700,000, that of the horsemen 80,000, 
to which must be added the Arabs, who rode on camels, and the Libyans, who fought in chariots, whom I reckon at twenty thousand. The whole number, therefore, of the land and sea forces added together amounts to two million three hundred and seventeen thousand six hundred and ten men. Such was the force brought from Asia, without including the camp followers or taking any account of the provision ships and the men whom they had on board. To the amount thus reached, we have still to add the forces gathered in Europe, concerning which I can only speak from conjecture. The Greeks dwelling in Thrace and in the islands off the coast of Thrace furnished to the fleet 120 ships, the crews of which would amount to 24,000 men. Besides these, footmen were furnished by the Thracians, the Paeonians, the Eordians, the Botiaeans, by the Chalcidian tribes, by the Brygians, the Pyrians, the Macedonians, the Perabians, the Enianians, the Dolopians, the Magnesians, the Achaeans, and by all the dwellers upon the Thracian seaboard. And the forces of these nations amounted, I believe, to 300,000 men. These numbers, added to those of the force which came out of Asia, make the sum of the fighting men 2,641,610. Such then being the number of the fighting men, it's my belief that the attendants who followed the camp, together with the crews of the corn barks and of the other craft accompanying the army, made up an amount rather above than below that of the fighting men. However, I won't reckon them as either fewer or more, but take them at an equal number. We have therefore to add to the sum already reached an exactly equal amount. This will give 5,283,220 as the whole number of men brought by Xerxes, the son of Darius, as far as Sepius and Thermopylae. Such then was the amount of the entire host of Xerxes. As for the number of the women who ground the corn, and of the concubines, and to the eunuchs, no one can give any sure account of it. Nor can the baggage horses and the other sumpter beasts, nor the Indian hounds which followed the army, be calculated by reason of their multitude. Hence I am not at all surprised that the water of the rivers was found too scant for the army in some instances. Rather, it's a marvel to me how the provisions didn't fail when the numbers were so great. For I find on calculation that if each man consumed no more than a coinix of corn a day, there must have been used daily by the army 110,340 medimni, and this without counting what was eaten by the women, the eunuchs, the sumter beasts, and the hounds. Among all this multitude of men, there wasn't one who, for beauty and stature, deserved more than Xerxes himself to wield so vast a power. The fleet then, as I said, on leaving Therma, sailed to the Magnesian territory and there occupied the strip of coast between the city of Casthenia and Cape Sepius. The ships of the first row were moored to the land, while the remainder swung at anchor further off. The beach extended but a very little way, so that they had to anchor off the shore, row upon row, eight deep. In this manner they passed the night. But at dawn of day, calm and stillness gave place to a raging sea, and a violent storm which fell upon them from a strong gale from the east, a wind which the people in those parts call Hellespontius. Such of them as perceived the wind rising, and were so moored as to allow of it, forestalled the tempest by dragging their ships up on the beach, and in this way saved both themselves and their vessels. But the ships which the storm caught out at sea were driven ashore, some of them near the place called Impni, the ovens at the foot of Pelion, others on the strand itself, others again about Cape Sepius, while a portion were dashed to pieces near the cities of Meliboya and Casthenia. There was no resisting the tempest. It said that the Athenians had called upon Boreas to aid the Greeks on account of a fresh oracle which had reached to them, commanding them to seek help from their son-in-law. For Boreas, according to the tradition of the Greeks, took to wife a woman of Attica, 
that's to say Orithia, the daughter of Erechtheus. So the Athenians, as the tale goes, considering that this marriage made Boreas their son-in-law, and perceiving, while they lay with their ships at Calchis of Euboea, that the wind was rising, or it may be even before it freshened, offered sacrifice both to Boreas and likewise to Orithia, entreating them to come to their aid and to destroy the ships of the barbarians, as they did once before off Mount Athos. Whether it was owing to this that Boreas fell with violence on the barbarians at their anchorage, I can't say. But the Athenians declare that they had received aid from Boreas before, and that it was he who now caused all these disasters. They therefore, on their return home, built a temple to this god on the banks of the Ilissus. Such as put the loss of the Persian fleet in this storm at the lowest say that four hundred of their ships were destroyed, that a countless multitude of men were slain, and a vast treasure engulfed. Aminocles, the son of Cretines, a Magnesian who farmed land near Cape Sepius, found the wreck of these vessels a source of great gain to him. Many were the gold and silver drinking cups cast up long afterwards by the surf, which he gathered while the treasure boxes, too, which had belonged to the Persians, and golden articles of all kinds and beyond count, came into his possession. And Minocles grew to be a man of great wealth in this way, but in other respects things didn't go over well with him. He, too, like other men, had his own grief, the calamity of losing his offspring. As for the number of the provision craft and other merchant ships which perished, it was beyond count. Indeed, such was the loss that the commanders of the sea force, fearing lest in their shattered condition the Thessalians should venture on an attack, raised a lofty barricade about their station out of the wreck of the vessels cast ashore. The storm lasted three days. At length the Magians, by offering victims to the winds and charming them with the help of conjurers, while at the same time they sacrificed to Thetis and the Nereids, succeeded in laying the storm four days after it first began, or perhaps it ceased of itself. The reason of their offering sacrifice to Thetis was this. They were told by the Ionians that here was the place whence Peleus carried her off, and that the whole promontory was sacred to her and to her sister Nereids. So the storm lulled upon the fourth day. The scouts left by the Greeks about the highlands of Euboea hastened down from their stations on the day following that whereon the storm began, and acquainted their countrymen with all that had befallen the Persian fleet. These no sooner heard what had happened than straightway they returned thanks to Poseidon the Saviour, and poured libations in his honour, after which they hastened back with all speed to Artemisium, expecting to find a very few ships left to oppose them, and arriving there for the second time, took up their station on that strip of coast. Not from that day to the present have they ceased to address Poseidon by the name then given him of Saviour. The barbarians, when the wind lulled and the sea grew smooth, drew their ships down to the water and proceeded to coast along the mainland. Having then rounded the extreme point of Magnesia, they sailed straight into the bay that runs up to Bagasai. There's a place in this bay belonging to Magnesia, where Hercules is said to have been put ashore to fetch water by Jason and his companions, who then deserted him and went on their way to Aya in Colchis on board the ship Argo in quest of the Golden Fleece. From the circumstance that they intended, after watering their vessel at this place, to quit the shore and launch forth into the deep, it received the name of Aphitai. Here then it was that the fleet of Xerxes came to an anchor. Fifteen ships, which had lagged greatly behind the rest, happening to catch sight of the Greek fleet at Artemisium, mistook it for their own, and sailing down into the midst of it, fell into the hands of the enemy. The commander of this squadron was Sandukes, the son of Thamasius, governor of Chime, in Iolis. He was of the number of the royal judges, and had been crucified by Darius some time before on the charge of taking a bribe to determine a cause wrongly. 
that while he yet hung on the cross, Darius bethought him that the good deeds of Sandokes towards the king's house were more numerous than his evil deeds. And so, confessing that he had acted with more haste than wisdom, he ordered him to be taken down and set at large. Thus Sandokes escaped destruction at the hands of Darius, and was alive at this time, but he wasn't fated to come off so cheaply from his second peril, for as soon as the Greeks saw the ships making towards them, they guessed their mistake, and putting to sea, took them without difficulty. Adidolis, tyrant of Albanda in Cardia, was on board one of the ships and was made prisoner, as also was the Paphian general Penthilus, the son of Demonous, who was on board another. Now, this person had brought with him twelve ships from Paphos, and after losing eleven in the storm off Sepius, was taken in the remaining one as he sailed towards Artemisium. The Greeks, after questioning their prisoners as much as they wished concerning the forces of Xerxes, sent them away in chains to the Isthmus of Corinth. The sea force of the barbarians, with the exception of the fifteen ships commanded, as I said by Sandokes, came safe to Aphetai. Xerxes, meanwhile, with the land army, had proceeded through Thessaly and Achaea, and three days earlier had entered the territory of the Malians. In Thessaly he matched his own horses against the Thessalian, which he heard were the best in Greece, but the Greek coursers were left far behind in the race. All the rivers in this region had water enough to supply his army, except only the Onoconus. But in Achaea, the largest of the streams, the Apidanus, barely held out. On his arrival at Aulus in Achaea, his guides, wishing to inform him of everything, told him the tale known to the dwellers in those parts concerning the temple of the Laphistian Zeus, how that Athamas, the son of Aeolus, took counsel with Eno and plotted the death of Phrixus, and how that afterwards the Achaeans, warned by an oracle, laid a forfeit upon his posterity, forbidding the eldest of the race ever to enter into the courthouse, which they call the people's house, and keeping watch themselves to see the law obeyed. If one comes within the doors, he can never go out again except to be sacrificed. Further, they told him how that many persons, when on the point of being slain, are seized with such fear that they flee away and take refuge in some other country, and that these, if they come back long afterwards and are found to be the persons who entered the courthouse, are led forth, covered with chaplets and in a grand procession, and are sacrificed. This forfeit is paid by the descendants of Kittisaurus, the son of Phrixus, because when the Achaeans, in obedience to an oracle, made Athamus, the son of Aeolus, their sin offering, and were about to slay him, Kittisaurus came from Aia in Colchis and rescued Athamus, by which deed he brought the anger of the god upon his own posterity. Xerxes, therefore, having heard this story when he reached the grove of a god, avoided it, and commanded his army to do the like. He also paid the same respect to the house and precinct of the descendants of Athamus. Such were the doings of Xerxes in Thessaly and in Achaea. From hence he passed on into Melis, along the shores of a bay in which there is an ebb and flow of the tide daily. By the side of this bay lies a piece of flat land, in one part broad, but in another very narrow indeed, around which runs a range of lofty hills impossible to climb, enclosing all Melis within them, and called the Trachinian Cliffs. The first city upon the bay, as you come from Achaea, is Antichaira, near which the river Spercaius, flowing down from the country of the Enianians, empties itself into the sea. About twenty furlongs from this stream there is a second river called the Diarus, which is said to have appeared first to help Heracles when he was burning. Again, at the distance of twenty furlongs, there is a stream called the Melus, near which, within about five furlongs, stands the city of Trachis. At the point where this city is built, the plain between the hills and the sea is broader than at any other but it there measures 22,000 plethora. South of Trachis there is a cleft in the mountain range which shuts in the territory of Trachinia, and the river Asopus, issuing from this cleft, 
flows for a while along the foot of the hills. Further to the south, another river called the Phoenix, which has no great body of water, flows from the same hills and falls into the Asopus. Here is the narrowest place of all, for in this part there is only a causeway wide enough for a single carriage. From the river Phoenix to Thermopylae is a distance of fifteen furlongs, and in this space is situated the village called Anthela, which the river Asopus passes ere it reaches the sea. The space about Anthela is of some width, and contains a temple of Amphictyonian Demeter, as well as the seats of the Amphictyonic deputies, and a temple of Amphictyon himself. King Xerxes pitched his camp in the region of Melis, called Trachinia, while on their side the Greeks occupied the straits. These straits the Greeks in general call Thermopylae, the hot gates, but the natives and those who dwell in the neighbourhood call them Pili, the gates. Here then the two armies took their stand, the one master of all the region lying north of Trachis, the other of the country extending southward of that place to the verge of the continent. The Greeks who at this spot awaited the coming of Xerxes were the following. From Sparta, three hundred men-at-arms. From Arcadia, a thousand Tegeans and Mantineans, five hundred of each people. A hundred and twenty Orchomenians, from the Arcadian Orchomenus. And a thousand from other cities from Corinth, four hundred men. From Phleas, two hundred and from Mycenae, eighty. Such was the number from the Peloponnese. There were also present from Boeotia seven hundred Thespians and four hundred Thebans. Besides these troops, the Locrians of Opus and the Phocians had obeyed the call of their countrymen and sent the former all the force they had, the latter a thousand men. For envoys had gone from the Greeks at Thermopylae among the Locrians and Phocians to call on them for assistance and to say they were themselves but the vanguard of the host, sent to precede the main body which might every day be expected to follow them. The sea was in good keeping, watched by the Athenians, the Aeginetans, and the rest of the fleet. There was no cause why they should fear, for after all the invader was not a god but a man and there never had been and never would be a man who wasn't liable to misfortunes from the very day of his birth, and those misfortunes greater in proportion to his own greatness. The assailant, therefore, being only a mortal, must needs fall from his glory. Thus urged, the Locrians and the Phocians had come with their troops to Trachis. The various nations had each captains of their own under whom they served but the one to whom all especially looked up, and who had the command of the entire force, was the Lacedaemonian Leonidas. Now Leonidas was the son of Anaxandridas, who was the son of Leo, who was the son of Eurycratidas, who was the son of Anaxander, who was the son of Eurycrates, who was the son of Polydorus, who was the son of Alcamenes, who was the son of Telecles, who was the son of Archelaus, who was the son of Agesilaus, who was the son of Dorissus, who was the son of Labotus, who was the son of Echestratus, who was the son of Agis, who was the son of Eurysthenes, who was the son of Aristodemus, who was the son of Aristomachus, who was the son of Cleodius, who was the son of Helus, who was the son of Hercules. Leonidas had come to be king of Sparta quite unexpectedly. Having two elder brothers, Cleomenes and Dorius, he had no thought of ever mounting the throne. However, when Cleomenes died without male offspring, as Dorius was likewise deceased, having perished in Sicily, the crown fell to Leonidas, who was older than Cleombritus, the youngest of the sons of Anaxandridas, and moreover was married to the daughter of Cleomenes. He had now come to Thermopylae accompanied by the three hundred men which the law assigned him, whom he had himself chosen from among the citizens, and who were all of them fathers with sons living. On his way he had taken the troops from Thebes, whose number I have already mentioned, and who were under the command of Leontiades, the son of Eurymachus. 
The reason why he made a point of taking troops from Thebes, and Thebes only, was that the Thebans were strongly suspected of being well inclined to the Medes. Leonidas therefore called on them to come with him to the war, wishing to see whether they would comply with his demand or openly refuse and disclaim the Greek alliance. They, however, though their wishes lent the other way, nevertheless sent the men. The force with Leonidas was sent forward by the Spartans in advance of their main body, that the sight of them might encourage the allies to fight and hinder them from going over to the Medes, as it was likely they might have done, had they seen that Sparta was backward. They intended presently, when they'd celebrated the Carnaian festival, which was what now kept them at home, to leave a garrison in Sparta, and hasten in full force to join the army. The rest of the allies also intended to act similarly, for it happened that the Olympic festival fell exactly at this same period. None of them looked to see the contest at Thermopylae decided so speedily, wherefore they were content to send forward a mere advanced guard. Such, accordingly, were the intentions of the Allies. The Greek forces at Thermopylae, when the Persian army drew near to the entrance of the pass, were seized with fear, and a council was held to consider about a retreat. It was the wish of the Peloponnesians generally that the army should fall back upon the Peloponnese and there guard the Isthmus. But Leonidas, who saw with what indignation the Phocians and Locrians heard of this plan, gave his voice for remaining where they were, while they sent envoys to the several cities to ask for help, since they were too few to make a stand against an army like that of the Medes. While this debate was going on, Xerxes sent a mounted spy to observe the Greeks and note how many they were and see what they were doing. He'd heard before he came out of Thessaly that a few men were assembled at this place and that at their head were certain Lacedaemonians under Leonidas, a descendant of Heracles. The horseman rode up to the camp and looked about him but didn't see the whole army for such as were on the further side of the wall, which had been rebuilt and was now carefully guarded, it wasn't possible for him to behold, but he observed those on the outside who were encamped in front of the rampart. It chanced that at this time the Lacedaemonians held the outer guard and were seen by the spy, some of them engaged in gymnastic exercises, others combing their long hair. At this the spy greatly marvelled, but he counted their number, and when he had taken accurate note of everything, he rode back quietly, for no one pursued after him, nor paid any heed to his visit. So he returned, and told Xerxes all that he had seen. Upon this, Xerxes, who had no means of surmising the truth, namely that the Spartans were preparing to do or die manfully, but thought it laughable that they should be engaged in such employments, sent and called to his presence Demaratus, the son of Ariston, who still remained with the army. When he appeared, Xerxes told him all that he had heard, and questioned him concerning the news, since he was anxious to understand the meaning of such behaviour on the part of the Spartans. Then Demaratus said, I spake to thee, O king, concerning these men long since, when we had but just begun our march upon Greece. Thou, however, didst only laugh at my words when I told thee of all this, which I saw would come to pass. Earnestly do I struggle at all times to speak truth to thee, sire, and now listen to it once more. These men have come to dispute the pass with us, and it is for this that they are now making ready. "'Tis their custom, when they are about to hazard their lives, "'to adorn their heads with care. "'But be assured, however, that if thou canst subdue the men who are here "'and the Lacedaemonians who remain in Sparta, "'there is no other nation in all the world "'which will venture to lift a hand in their defence. "'Thou hast now to deal with the first kingdom and town in Greece, "'and with the bravest men.' Then Xerxes, to whom what Demaratus said seemed altogether to surpass belief, asked further how it was possible for so small an army to contend with his. O oh, King, Demaratus answered, let me be treated as a liar if matters fall not out as I say. But Xerxes was not persuaded any the more. Four whole days he suffered to go by, expecting that the Greeks would run away. 
When, however, he found on the 5th that they were not gone, thinking that their firm stand was mere impudence and recklessness, he grew wroth and sent against them the Medes and Kissians, with orders to take them alive and bring them into his presence. Then the Medes rushed forward and charged the Greeks, but fell in vast numbers. Others, however, took the places of the slain and would not be beaten off, though they suffered terrible losses. In this way it became clear to all, and especially to the king, that though he had plenty of competence, he had but very few warriors. The struggle, however, continued during the whole day. Then the Medes, having met so rough a reception, withdrew from the fight, and their place was taken by the band of Persians under Hidanes, whom the king called his immortals. They, it was thought, would soon finish the business. But when they joined battle with the Greeks, t'was no better success than the Median detachment. Things went much as before, the two armies fighting in a narrow space, and the barbarians using shorter spears than the Greeks, and having no advantage from their numbers. The Lacedaemonians fought in a way worthy of note, and showed themselves far more skilful in fight than their adversaries, often turning their backs, and making as though they were all flying away, on which the barbarians would rush after them with much noise and shouting, when the Spartans at their approach would wheel round and face their pursuers, in this way destroying vast numbers of the enemy. Some Spartans likewise fell in these encounters, but only a very few. At last the Persians, finding that all their efforts to gain the pass availed nothing, and that whether they attacked by divisions or in any other way it was to no purpose, withdrew to their own quarters. During these assaults it said that Xerxes, who was watching the battle, thrice leapt from the throne on which he sat, in terror for his army. Next day the combat was renewed, but with no better success on the part of the barbarians. The Greeks were so few that the barbarians hoped to find them disabled, by reason of their wounds, from offering any further resistance, and so they once more attacked them. But the Greeks were drawn up in detachments according to their cities, and bore the brunt of the battle in turns, all except the Phocians, who had been stationed on the mountain to guard the pathway. So when the Persians found no difference between that day and the preceding, they again retired to their quarters. Now as the king was in a great strait, and knew not how he should deal with the emergency, Ephialtes, the son of Eurydemus, a man of Melis, came to him, and was admitted to a conference. Stirred by the hope of receiving a rich reward at the king's hands, he had come to tell him, of the pathway which led across the mountain to Thermopylae, by which disclosure he brought destruction on the band of Greeks who had there withstood the barbarians. This Ephialtes afterwards, from fear of the Lacedaemonians, fled into Thessaly, and during his exile in an assembly of the Amphictyons held at Pili, a price was set upon his head by the Pelagari. When some time had gone by, he returned from exile and went to Antichira, where he was slain by Athenides, a native of Trachis. Athenides didn't slay him for his treachery, but for another reason which I'll mention in a later part of my history. Yet still the Lacedaemonians honoured him none the less. Thus then did Ephialtes perish a long time afterwards. Besides this, there's another story told, which I don't at all believe, to wit that Onetus, the son of Phanagoras, a native of Charistus, and Corydilus, a man of Antichira, were the persons who spoke on this matter to the king and took the Persians across the mountain. One may guess which story is true from the fact that the deputies of the Greeks, the Pelagari, who must have had the best means of ascertaining the truth, didn't offer the reward for the heads of Anetus and Corydilus, but for that of Aphialtes of Trachis, and again from the flight of Ephialtes, which we know to have been on this account. Onetus, I allow, though he was not a Malian, might have been acquainted with the path, if he had lived much in that part of the country, but as Ephialtes was the person who actually led the Persians round the mountain by the pathway, I leave his name on record as that of the man who did the deed. Great was the joy of Xerxes on this occasion, and as he approved highly of the enterprise which Ephialtes undertook to accomplish, 
he forthwith sent upon the errant Hidanis and the Persians under him. The troops left the camp about the time of the lighting of the lamps. The pathway along which they went was first discovered by the Malians of these parts, who soon afterwards led the Thessalians by it to attack the Phocians at the time when the Phocians fortified the pass with a wall and so put themselves under covered from danger. And ever since the path has always been put to an ill use by the Malians. The course which it takes is the following, beginning at the Asopus, where that stream flows through the cleft in the hills, it runs along the ridge of the mountain, which is called, like the pathway over it, Anopaia, and ends at the city of Alpinus, the first Locrian town as you come from Melis, by the stone called Melampigus, and the seats of the Cacopians. Here it's as narrow as at any other point. The Persians took this path, and crossing the Asopus, continued their march through the whole of the night, having the mountains of Oita on their right hand, and on their left those of Trachis. At dawn of day they found themselves close to the summit. Now the hill was guarded, as I've already said, by a thousand Phocian men-at-arms, who were placed there to defend the pathway, and at the same time to secure their own country. They'd been given the guard of the mountain path, while the other Greeks defended the pass below, because they'd volunteered for the service, and had pledged to themselves to Leonidas to maintain the post. The ascent of the Persians became known to the Phocians in the following manner. During all the time that they were making their way up, the Greeks remained unconscious of it, inasmuch as the whole mountain was covered with groves of oak. But it happened that the air was very still, and the leaves which the Persians stirred with their feet made, as it was likely they would, a loud rustling, whereupon the Phocians jumped up and flew to seize their arms. In a moment the barbarians came in sight, and perceiving men arming themselves were greatly amazed, for they had fallen in with an enemy when they expected no opposition. Hidanes, alarmed at the sight and fearing lest the Phocians might be Lacedaemonians, inquired of Ephialtes to what nation these troops belonged. Ephialtes told him the exact truth, whereupon he arrayed his Persians for battle. The Phocians, galled by the showers of arrows to which they were exposed, and imagining themselves the special object of the Persian attack, fled hastily to the crest of the mountain, and there made ready to meet death. But while their mistake continued, the Persians, with Ephialtes and Hidanes, not thinking it worth their while to delay on account of Phocians, passed on and descended the mountain with all possible speed. The Greeks at Thermopylae received the first warning of the destruction which the dawn would bring on them from the seer Megistius, who read their fate in the victims as he was sacrificing. After this, deserters came in and brought the news that the Persians were marching round by the hills. It was still night when these men arrived. Last of all, the scouts came running down from the heights and brought in the same accounts when the day was just beginning to break. Then the Greeks held a council to consider what they should do, and here opinions were divided. Some were strong against quitting their post, while others contended to the contrary. So when the council had broken up, part of the troops departed and went their ways homeward to their several states, Part, however, resolved to remain, and to stand by Leonidas to the last. It said that Leonidas himself sent away the troops who departed because he tendered their safety, but thought it unseemly that either he or his Spartans should quit the post which they had been especially sent to guard. For my own part, I incline to think that Leonidas gave the order because he perceived the allies to be out of heart and unwilling to encounter the danger to which his own mind was made up. He therefore commanded them to retreat, but said that he himself couldn't draw back with honour, knowing that if he stayed, glory awaited him, and that Sparta in that case would not lose her prosperity. For when the Spartans, at the very beginning of the war, sent to consult the oracle concerning it, the answer which they received from the Pythoness was that either Sparta must be overthrown by the barbarians, or one of her kings must perish. The prophecy was delivered in hexameter verse, 
and ran thus, O ye men who dwell in the streets of broad Lacedaemon, either your glorious town shall be sacked by the children of Perseus, or in exchange must all through the whole Laconian country mourn for the loss of a king, descendant of great Heracles. He cannot be withstood by the courage of bulls nor of lions. Strive as they may. He is mighty as Jove. There is naught that shall stay him till he have got for his prey your king or your glorious city. The remembrance of this answer, I think, and the wish to secure the whole glory for the Spartans caused Leonidas to send the allies away. This is more likely than that they quarrelled with him and took their departure in such unruly fashion. To me it seems no small argument in favour of this view that the seer also who accompanied the army, Megistius, the Acarnanian, said to have been of the blood of Melampus, and the same who was led by the appearance of the victims to warn the Greeks of the danger which threatened them, received orders to retire, as it is certain he did, from Leonidas, that he might escape the coming destruction. Megistius, however, though bidden to depart, refused, and stayed with the army, but he had an only son present with the expedition, whom he now sent away. So the allies, when Leonidas ordered them to retire, obeyed him and forthwith departed. Only the Thespians and the Thebans remained with the Spartans, and of these the Thebans were kept back by Leonidas as hostages, very much against their will. The Thespians, on the contrary, stayed entirely of their own accord, refusing to retreat, and declaring that they wouldn't forsake Leonidas and his followers. So they abode with the Spartans, and died with them. Their leader was Demophilus, the son of Diadromes. At sunrise Xerxes made libations, after which he waited until the time when the forum is wont to fill, and then began his advance. Ephialtes had instructed him thus, as the descent of the mountain is much quicker, and the distance much shorter than the way round the hills, and the ascent. So the barbarians under Xerxes began to draw nigh, and the Greeks under Leonidas, as they now went forth, determined to die, advanced much further than on previous days, until they reached the more open portion of the pass. Hitherto they had held their station within the wall, and from this had gone forth to fight at the point where the pass was the narrowest. Now they joined battle beyond the defile, and carried slaughter among the barbarians who fell in heaps. Behind them the captains of the squadrons, armed with whips, urged their men forward with continual blows. Many were thrust into the sea, and there perished. A still greater number were trampled to death by their own soldiers. No one heeded the dying. For the Greeks, reckless of their own safety and desperate, since they knew that as the mountain had been crossed, their destruction was nigh at hand, exerted themselves with the most furious valour, against the barbarians. By this time the spears of the greater number were all shivered, and with their swords they hewed down the ranks of the Persians. And here, as they strove, Leonidas fell, fighting bravely, together with many other famous Spartans, whose names I have taken care to learn on account of their great worthiness, as indeed I have those of all the three hundred. There fell, too, at the same time very many famous Persians, among them two sons of Darius, Abrochemes and Hyperanthes, his children by Fratagune, the daughter of Artanes. Artanes was brother of King Darius, being a son of his Taspes, the son of Arsames, and when he gave his daughter to the king, he made him heir likewise of all his substance, for she was his only child. Thus two brothers of Xerxes here fought and fell, and now there arose a fierce struggle between the Persians and the Lacedaemonians over the body of Leonidas, in which the Greeks four times drove back the enemy, and at last, by their great bravery, succeeded in bearing off the body. This combat was scarcely ended when the Persians and Ephialtes approached, and the Greeks, informed that they drew nigh, made a change in the manner of their fighting. Drawing back into the narrowest part of the pass and retreating even behind the cross wall, they posted themselves upon a hillock, 
where they stood all drawn up together in one close body, except only the Thebans. The hillock whereof I speak is at the entrance of the straits, where the stone lion stands, which was set up in honour of Leonidas. Here they defended themselves to the last, such as still had swords, using them, and the others resisting with their hands and teeth, till the barbarians, who in part had pulled down the wall and attacked them in front, in part had gone round and now encircled them upon every side, overwhelmed and buried the remnant which was left beneath showers of missile weapons. Thus nobly did the whole body of Lacedaemonians and Thespians behave. But nevertheless, one man is said to have distinguished himself above all the rest, to wit, Dionysus the Spartan. A speech which he made before the Greeks engaged the Medes remains on record. One of the Trachinians told him such was the number of the barbarians that when they shot forth their arrows, the sun would be darkened by their multitude. Dionysus, not at all frightened at these words, but making light of the Median numbers, answered, Our Trachinian friend brings us excellent tidings. If the Medes darken the sun, we shall have our fight in the shade. Other sayings, too, of a like nature are reported to have been left on record by this same person. Next to him, two brothers, Lacedaemonians, are reputed to have made themselves conspicuous. They were named Alpheus and Maro, and were the sons of Orsiphantus. There was also a Thespian who gained greater glory than any of his countrymen. He was a man called Dithyrambus, the son of Harmatidas. The slain were buried where they fell, and in their honour, nor less in honour of those who died before Leonidas sent the allies away, an inscription was set up which said, Here did four thousand men from Pelops' land against three hundred myriads bravely stand. This was in honour of all. Another was for the Spartans alone. Go, stranger, and to Lacedaemon tell that here, obeying her behests, we fell. This was for the Lacedaemonians. The seer had the following. The great Megistius's tomb you here may view, whom slew the Medes fresh from Specaius's fords. Well the wise seer the coming death foreknew, yet scorned he to forsake his Spartan lords. These inscriptions and the pillars likewise were all set up by the Amphictyons, except that in honour of Megistius, which was inscribed to him on account of their sworn friendship by Simonides, the son of Leocrates. Two of the three hundred, it said, Aristodemus and Eurytus, having been attacked by a disease of the eyes, had received orders from Leonidas to quit the camp, and both lay at Alpini in the worst stage of the malady. And these two men might, had they been so minded, have agreed together to return alive to Sparta, or if they didn't like to return, they might have gone both to the field and fallen with their countrymen. But at this time, when either way was open to them, unhappily they couldn't agree, but took contrary courses. Eurytus no sooner heard that the Persians had come round the mountain than straightway he called for his armour, and having buckled it on, bade his helot lead him to the place where his friends were fighting. The helot did so, and then turned and fled. But Eurytus plunged into the thick of the battle, and so perished. Aristodemus, on the other hand, was faint of heart, and remained at Alpini. It's my belief that if Aristodemus only had been sick and returned, or if both had come back together, the Spartans would have been content, and felt no angrier. But when there were two men with the very same excuse, and one of them was chary of his life, while the other freely gave it, they couldn't but be very wroth with the former. This is the account which some give of the escape of Aristodemus. Others say that he, with another, had been sent on a message from the army, and having it in his power to return in time for the battle, purposely loitered on the road, and so survived his comrades, while his fellow messenger came back in time and fell in the battle. When Aristodemus returned to Lacedaemon, reproach and disgrace awaited him. Disgrace, inasmuch as no Spartan would give him a light to kindle his fire, or so much as address a word to him, and reproach, since all spoke of him as the craven. 
However, he wiped away all his shame afterwards at the Battle of Plataea. Another of the 300 is likewise to have survived the battle, a man named Pantites, whom Leonidas had sent on an embassy into Thessaly. He, they say, on his return to Sparta, found himself in such disesteem that he hanged himself. The Thebans, under the command of Leontiades, remained with the Greeks and fought against the barbarians only so long as necessity compelled them. No sooner did they see victory inclining to the Persians and the Greeks under Leonidas hurrying with all speed towards the hillock than they moved away from their companions and with hands upraised advanced towards the barbarians, exclaiming, as was indeed most true, that they for their part wished well to the Medes and had been among the first to give earth and water to the king, force alone had brought them to Thermopylae, and so they must not be blamed for the slaughter which had befallen the king's army. These words, the truth of which was attested by the Thessalians, sufficed to obtain the Thebans the ground of their lives. However, their good fortune was not without some drawback, for several of them were slain by the barbarians on their first approach, and the rest, who were the greater number, had the royal mark branded upon their bodies by the command of Xerxes. Leontiades, their captain, being the first to suffer. This man's son, Eurymachus, was afterwards slain by the Plataeans when he came with a band of four hundred Thebans and seized their city. Thus fought the Greeks at Thermopylae. And Xerxes, after the fight was over, called for Demaratus to question him and began as follows. Demaratus, thou art a worthy man, thy true speaking proves it. All has happened as thou didst forewarn. Now then tell me, how many Lacedaemonians are there left, and of those left, how many are such brave warriors as these, or are they all alike? O king, replied the other, the whole number of the Lacedaemonians is very great, and many other cities which they inhabit. But I'll tell thee what thou really wishest to learn. There is a town of Lacedaemon called Sparta, which contains within it about eight thousand full-grown men. They are, one and all, equal to those who have fought here. The other Lacedaemonians are brave men, but not such warriors as these. Tell me now, Demaratus, rejoined Xerxes, how we may with least trouble subdue these men. Thou must know all the paths of their councils, as thou wert once their king. Then Demaratus answered, O king, since thou askest my advice so earnestly, it's fitting that I should inform thee what I consider to be the best course. Detach three hundred vessels from the body of thy fleet, and send them to attack the shores of Laconia. There's an island called Kithera in those parts, not far from the coast, concerning which Chelon, one of our wisest men, made the remark that Sparta would gain if it were sunk to the bottom of the sea. So constantly did he expect that it would give occasion to some project like that which I now recommend to thee. I mean not to say that he had a foreknowledge of thy attack upon Greece, but in truth he feared all armaments. Send thy ships then to this island, and thence affright the Spartans. If once they have a war of their own close to their doors, fear not their giving any help to the rest of the Greeks while thy land force is engaged in conquering them. In this way may all Greece be subdued, and then Sparta, left to herself, will be powerless. But if thou wilt not take this advice, I'll tell thee what thou mayst look to see. When thou comest to the Peloponnese, thou wilt find a narrow neck of land, where all the Peloponnesians who are leagued against thee will be gathered together, and there thou wilt have to fight bloodier battles than any which thou hast yet witnessed. If, however, thou wilt follow my plan, the isthmus and the cities of the Peloponnese will yield to thee without a battle. Achaemenes, who was present, now took the word and spoke. He was brother to Xerxes, and, having the command of the fleet, feared lest Xerxes might be prevailed upon to do as Demaratus advised. I perceive, O king, he said, that thou art listening to the words of a man who is envious of thy good fortune and seeks to betray thy cause. 
This is indeed the common temper of the Grecian people. They envy good fortune and hate power greater than their own. If in this posture of our affairs, after we've lost four hundred vessels by shipwreck, three hundred more be sent away to make a voyage round the Peloponnese, our enemies will become a match for us. But let us keep our whole fleet in one body, and it will be dangerous for them to venture on an attack, and they will certainly be no match for us then. Besides, while our sea and land forces advance together, the fleet and army can each help the other. But if they be parted, no aid will come either from thee to the fleet or from the fleet to thee. Only order thine own matters well, and trouble not thyself to inquire concerning the enemy, where they will fight, or what they will do, or how many they are. Surely they can manage their own concerns without us, as we can ours without them. If the Lacedaemonians come out against the Persians to battle, they will scarce repair the disaster which has befallen them now. Xerxes replied, Achaemenes, thy counsel pleases me well and I will do as thou sayest. But Demaratus advised what he thought best, only his judgment was not so good as thine. Never will I believe that he doesn't wish well to my cause, for that is disproved both by his former counsels and also by the circumstances of the case. A citizen does indeed envy any fellow citizen who is more lucky than himself, and often hates him secretly, if such a man be called on for counsel, he will not give his best thoughts, unless indeed he be a man of very exalted virtue, and such are but rarely found. But a friend of another country delights in the good fortune of his foreign bond friend, and will give him, when asked, the best advice in his power. Therefore I warn all men to abstain henceforth from speaking ill of Demaratus, who is my bond friend." When Xerxes had thus spoken, he proceeded to pass through the slain. And finding the body of Leonidas, whom he knew to have been the Lacedaemonian king and captain, he ordered that the head should be struck off and the trunk fastened to a cross. This proves to me most clearly what is plain also in many other ways, namely that King Xerxes was more angry with Leonidas while he was still in life than with any other mortal. Certes, he would not else have used his body so shamefully. For the Persians are wont to honor those who show themselves valiant in fight more highly than any other nation that I know. They, however, to whom the orders were given, did according to the commands of the king. I return now to a point in my history, which at the time I left incomplete. The Lacedaemonians were the first of the Greeks to hear of the king's design against their country, and it was at this time that they sent to consult the Delphic oracle and received the answer of which I spoke a while ago. The discovery was made to them in a very strange way. Demaratus, the son of Ariston, after he took refuge with the Medes, was not, in my judgment, which is supported by probability, a well-wisher to the Lacedaemonians. It may be questioned, therefore, whether he did what I am about to mention from goodwill or from insolent triumph. It happened that he was at Susa at the time when Xerxes determined to lead his army into Greece, and in this way, becoming acquainted with his design, he resolved to send tidings of it to Sparta. So as there was no other way of effecting his purpose, since the danger of being discovered was great, Demaratus framed the following contrivance. He took a pair of tablets, and clearing the wax away from them, wrote what the king was purposing to do upon the wood whereof the tablets were made. Having done this, he spread the wax once more over the writing, and so sent it. By these means, the guards placed to watch the roads, observing nothing but a blank tablet, were sure to give no trouble to the bearer. When the tablet reached Lacedaemon, there was no one, I understand, who could find out the secret, till Gorgo, the daughter of Cleomenes and wife of Leonidas, discovered it, and told the others, if they would scrape the wax off the tablet, she said, they would be sure to find the writing upon the wood. The Lacedaemonians took her advice, found the writing, and read it, after which they sent it round to the other Greeks. Such then is the account which is given of this matter.